to for political integrity. Um, Mr. Keeley and Shelly Ann Clark. Mike Keeley and Shelly Ann Clark. Mr. Keeley is the founder and co-chairman of the Canadian Institute for Political Integrity. He has over 15 years experience with international business, over 10 years experience with small and medium-sized business, and was the founder and coordinator of a large $160 million project in Hull, Quebec, as well as the president of the Petrovic Museum in Kashmashwa, Quebec. Please give me a please help me give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we traveled up uh, the mountain road from uh, Nelson, B.C., uh, and it gave me a, a new experience. I, I had heard about things that happened in the back seat of a pickup truck. <laughs> traveling up a mountain road was, uh, was a new experience for me. Uh, I enjoyed it. Usually at a, a meeting such as this, however, we normally hear from experts and usually those experts come to us from the mainstream media these are the people who teach our children educate us and eventually inform us of what is supposedly happening in the world now the one thing churches, schools, and media have in common is the fact that they have to fit history to a certain pattern because these people believe that everything that happens out there is a coincidence. We call them the coincidence theorists. Nothing is related. Churches don't want to speak about certain events because they might be taxed as a result. Schools have their curriculum written by people appointed by politicians and have to fit a certain image of these uh, politicians' sponsors. And of course the press is the propaganda arm of the New World Order and therefore belongs to bankers. And the large national media in Canada belongs to very few families. Paul Demarek, Conrad Black, John Bassett, the CBC Board of Directors, and the Thompson family are usually the ones who decide what you will hear, what you will believe is happening in the world. They choose when they hire individuals to work for their companies, people of like mind, people who think like them. And that way, it's not necessary to have daily meetings to inform reporters about what should or should not be printed. Then there are the other media, the ones you see occasionally, the underground media that believe in conspiracy theories. Tonight, you're going to hear from neither one of these two groups. You're going to hear only from eyewitnesses, people who have lived the events they're talking about, people who have seen it and have participated in those events. I would like, before I begin, to read for you from a book by Uni University of Toronto Divinity College professor Robert O'Driscoll from his recent book, one I'm sure you will not find on bookstore, but is available from the Institute if uh, after our discussions tonight you wish to contact us. There are envelopes on the table there with our address and even though it only gives my name you can address letters either to the Institute to me personally or to Shelley Ann Clark or to Bev Collins who by the way uh, the day before yesterday was confirmed as the president of the Canadian Institute for Political Integrity in British Columbia so Bev will talk about that when her turn comes up a little later on.
from the book then I read and it's from a play called The Terrors of the Year 2000. The author is Etienne Gilson and it goes this way. In every land and in all countries the people wait with fear and trembling for the powerful of the world to decide their lot for them. They hesitate, uncertain among the various forms of slavery which are being prepared for them. Listening with bated breath to the sound of those countries which fall one after the other with a crash followed by a long silence, they wonder in anguish how long will last this little liberty, i.e. free will, they still possess. The waiting is so tense that many feel a vague consent to slavery <coughs> germinating within themselves. With growing impatience, they await the arrival of the master who will impose on them all forms of slavery, starting with the worst and most degrading of all, that of the mind. Blessed be he who will deliver us from ourselves, they say. Alone, under a heaven henceforth empty, man offers to whoever is willing to take it this futile liberty which he does not know how to use. He is ready for all dictators, leaders of these human herds who follow them as guides and who are finally conducted by them to the same place, the abattoir. Professor O'Driscoll called me one day and said, Mr. Keeley, we in the Divinity College at St. Michael's University are very complicated scholars. We read old manuscripts, things that go back thousands of years, and we have a lot of difficulty explaining to ordinary people the things we have discovered. And we hope that somewhere along the line, you will be able to help us explain more clearly to people what we have discovered. His call came within weeks of a call from a native medicine man, and Tom Matinas, who happens to live at Blue Sea Lake with the Algonquins in northern Quebec, north of Ottawa. And Tom Matinas' plea to the Institute was basically the same thing. His plea was that within their own community they suffer in the same way non-Native peoples have suffered, with leaders that can be bought, and with people who lead them to places they don't want to go. They plead with us to study who they were some 500 years ago, the civilization they had before the bankers sent the explorers to North America and saw something that was threatening to the system they had set up in Europe. There were people here living without war, sharing in potlatch ceremonies, free of charge, without interest, everything they owned, and living in harmony with Mother Earth, making political decisions based around a constituent assembly concept where people sat together and told their leaders what they wanted to see, not the other way around. These two groups have asked us for help and assistance in spreading the word. We look around our society today and we can divide Canadians or any other group in the Western world into three sections. 90% of the people get their information from the mainstream media. They sit in front of a TV or read the Globe and Mail and decide that they have been informed about what's happening in the real world. 90% of the people have stopped thinking. 
has, have stopped using their intuition and must be directed daily to answers which have been prepackaged by others. We call these people the information workers. They are provided information. They work all week. Their whole task, is, especially in cities, it may not be the same in this part of British Columbia, but they have one thing in mind. Escaping the city at the end of the week, making it up to the cottage with a case of beer so that they don't have to deal with any important questions. And hopefully over a lifetime, they can have a sufficient pension to escape forever without having to deal with important questions. And then we have the knowledge workers, the 5% who are in charge of everything. 2.2% of the population of the United States owns 90% of the natural resources in that country. And 60% of the natural resources of the world. By any measure, that is an empire. And then there are the other 5%. Mostly the people, I guess, you would find in a room like this, people that want to be informed. And we call those the wisdom workers, people who receive information, and from that information, extract the knowledge about those things which are pertinent to their lives, and from that knowledge filter out the preponderance of the circumstantial evidence to prove what they then believe. If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, it's probably not a kangaroo. <laughs> Many people have stopped thinking of things for, uh, for themselves and instead only accept what other people on television or in the press will tell them. Shelley Ann Clark, who's here with us tonight, began her career in the civil service in the early 60s. She has spent her entire career with the Department of External Affairs. Since the election of the Liberal government last October, the name has now been changed to Foreign Affairs. Shelley Ann Clark was an eyewitness. She worked from 1986 to 88 for the third highest negotiator in the Free Trade Office during the negotiations between Canada and the United States. Not to be mistaken with NAFTA, which came later to implement many of the things that were written in the original free trade agreement, and many of which have been implemented in this country by order and council rather than by law. And we'll discuss that in more detail. But this moment I'd like to call upon Shelley Ann Clark to tell you what it is she saw. No theory here. What she saw and what she did while she worked at the Free Trade Office. Shelley Ann. Time, two weeks at a time in order to bring a very important message and very important information to all Canadians. I'm having to do it this way because I have been blacklisted from all mainstream media. As you've just heard, my name is Shelley Ann Clark and I was an eyewitness and I read these books that were presented to your provincial premiers across the country. I read these books under instructions by a Mr. Germain Denis, 
who was my boss and the third highest ranking official in the negotiation. <coughs> Mr. Denis was put in place by Brian Mulroney, especially in order to mislead the premiers of this country so that they would accept the free trade agreement. Even though the statute and government that governs our provinces state very clearly that to pass anything in Parliament and the free trade agreement included does not require the signature of your provincial pre of your premier. That's quite true. But because the free trade agreement was going to force the provinces into changing all of their trade rules and practices, and because the United States of America was refusing to have anything to do with our free trade agreement unless all the premiers were on board, and for it, there would have been no free trade agreement in this country. Therefore, it was essential that the free trade agreement be acceptable to our premiers. So Brian Mulroney put in place Mr. Germain Genou. The story begins in September 1986. In September 1986, there was a computer system put in place at the Free Trade Office at 50 O'Connor Street in Ottawa that was supposed to be security. The secure system means that no one but the person operating in that computer can access the documents or view them. It means that anyone from the outside the building cannot have any gadget that can let them enter the system. Therefore, the system that was worth $1.2 million called GAC was brought into the Free Trade Office. At 7 o'clock on a Friday evening, I was called by the executive assistant of the one Mrs. Sylvia Austri, who was the deputy minister for multilateral trade. Mrs. Austrey needed a document that was on my secretary system because she was flying out of Ottawa at 9 o'clock that evening. And I said to the executive assistant, well, I don't have my secretary's passport and in order to enter any of these, these systems, you must have their passport. But I'll see what I can do. I immediately went to locate the person that had brought in the system expecting to be told that Sylvia Austrian would have to do without her document. When I approached this person, I was immediately told that there was no problem. So my instinctive reaction, because we were a government and attached to the government, my immediate reaction was, well, Peter, are you keeping a log of everyone's passport? And his response was, Oh God, no, I wouldn't do that because if anything ever leaked out of here, they'd put the blame on me. And I said, Well, how can you be telling me that I can get this document for Sylvia Austri? He said, Well, the president of GIAC has what he calls a, quote, God password. How can a private industry company, especially a computer company, have access to all of the computers at the Free Trade Office? I'm from Foreign Affairs. I go overseas. I am highly trained in security matters. And the one thing in Ottawa that you find out if you ever live in Ottawa and work for government is that Foreign Affairs and the Department of National Defense have got top security. All memorandum to cabinet are classified at secret and top secret level. And especially the negotiating tactics 
that we're going to be used to negotiate this deal with the Americans certainly could not be accessed by anyone but our government officials or they would know the game ahead of time. They would, we would be showing them that our hand. So I didn't understand. I really didn't understand. In order to get valid proof before I went to my security people, I asked Peter Hines to proceed and obtain, call the president of GIAC and obtain this copy. Within 20 minutes, I had this document in my hand. The very next morning, I proceeded to meet with the head of the free trade office security person. It took me one hour to convince this gentleman that something was seriously wrong. If a company that was outside government, and not only a company outside government, but in government, people have a different level of security clearances. Some people have no security clearances. For example, myself, to obtain the top secret level and the same level as the prime minister, it took years for the intelligence people at foreign affairs to have myself and my family investigated before I obtained such a level of security. Therefore, you are dealing not only with a private company having access, but people without my clearance could not have access. So my whole point to this security officer was that if this private company has access, there's something that's very strange here. I am certain that they must be, um, this company must be American owned and this is just a Canadian subsidiary. After one hour of arguments, he agreed to investigate. 48 hours later, it was reported back to the chief of the negotiations, Mr. Ambassador Simon Reisman, and to his deputy chief, that indeed the GF company was American owned and its president was American. What does that tell you? The Americans would have had access to all of our documents way before they were brought to the table in Washington. <coughs> I mean, that signaled to me immediately that these negotiations were not on the up and up. That was the first incident that showed me that something was extremely wrong. The two top negotiators immediately had the system removed. They scrapped 1.2 million of our tax dollars and removed the system and brought in another system within that same week. Was this ever reported in your media? No. We go on from there to January 1987, when the main negotiating sessions begin in Washington. I was told that amongst the many, many hats that I wore in that office, I was the executive assistant to Germain Denis. I was the main liaison, and that's why I was able to be in the, in the center of all the communication. And that is why I have so much information to bring to you, was because I was the main liaison between the Free Trade Office, the Privy Council Office, the Premiers, and the Prime Minister's Office. I was in a central communication spot. I was then assigned in January another hat. I was told that I would be the person in charge of the preparation of the briefing books that would go to the main negotiating sessions. We had 35 people that would travel with the main team at the top. So 35 books had to be prepared and I was given a team of 17 people to assist me. The second issue that arises that could not be explained away to me was the fact that in government there is a chain of command that is always followed. I joined government and I've worked on Parliament Hill since 1961.
this chain of command has never been broken. The Prime Minister obtains his information and meets with the ministers, with all of his ministers, either on a one-on-one -on -one or in caucus or whatever, but he always speaks to his ministers. Where do the ministers get their information from? They can't possibly know it all. The deputy ministers, that's where they come in, they report to the minister and the minister reports to the prime minister. Where does the deputy minister get his information? He has assigned in what we call branches. There's a political branch, there's a culture branch, there's an agriculture branch. It goes right down the line that there are branches. A department is divided within branches. And the deputy minister names a person to be his assistant deputy minister from every area. So when he needs to know some information on a particular area, he calls in that assistant deputy minister gets everything he needs and promptly reports to his minister who carries it to the prime minister. When, so when I was told that I was to prepare the 35 briefing book, my question was, why is Simon Reisman, executive assistant, not doing this? Because after all, it's Simon that's going to be giving the okay for what goes into the negotiating book. I mean, this is his baby. The Prime Minister hired him personally. He appointed him to this job. What is he doing? How come the third in command, the assistant deputy minister level, the person I was working for, was the third down the line, assistant deputy minister? And he's going to give his signature for what goes into the Washington book? It didn't make any sense whatsoever. But I had to accept that. So I I kept careful notes of all these things because they were serious enough to be noteworthy. So I kept a, a law. When it came time for them, I, I got all the briefing books prepared and they went off to Washington. On the way back, on their return, I was told, you're also going to be in charge of preparing the provincial briefing books. And I looked at the man, thinking that he was drunk or something. I said, why do I have to prepare provincial briefing books? I have 35 books that you brought back with you from Washington. And surely all of you have made notes as to where you, what you negotiated and, and what occurred. I will use the 10 of the 35 Washington books and you can pass them on to the Premier. And he said, I'll explain later, I don't have the time now. I went home that evening, and at approximately 11.30 p.m., I was called at home, and I was ordered to return to the Free Trade Office, but not to tell my husband or anyone else that I was going to meet him at the Free Trade Office. With my background in security and foreign affairs, you are thought that, especially over the telephone, you never ask questions. You just obey orders. I didn't understand how I could get into the building at midnight at night without anyone knowing, because he had been so specific that no one must know. How do I get into a high security building that has keys to the elevator, and the only person with the key to the elevator to bring me up to the 17th floor would be the security guard at the front door? Anyone that left that building or arrived it after 6 p.m. at night had to sign in and out at the exact time. And the person would unlock the elevator and let you up or down. Well, I understood very quickly. When I arrived at the free trade office in the garage, Mr. Denis was waiting for me in the garage. And he had the key to the elevator. He said, that way there will be absolutely no record of our being here. 
and I was brought up to the 17th floor still not understanding the secrecy involved. When we reached the 17th floor and I sat at my computer, I was told that I was going to be shown how to break into the system because I would have to access because Mr. Denis had working for him all these people that prepared the papers that went into the briefing book. These people had those papers in their computers and I would have to break into their system, bring it on, copy it on to my computer. That done, I was then told to make a copy, to make a second file. And he said that second copy you will call provincial. I created a second file called provincial and the doctoring began. Where this country, where they had given away 40% to make it acceptable to our premier, they had changed it to 10%. The entire, I do not know how much reporting went on here about the negotiations, but I know that around most of the country, people were screaming about water and energy, that they were certain it was on the table, and Simon Reisman kept saying, no, the energy and the water is not on the table. Oh, it was on the table, both of them were on the table. And so were your social security programs on the table. But to mislead the premier, I was told to delete the entire water and energy chapter. They were totally deleted. On social security programs, they changed the word, they deleted the word harmonization. Because Definitely, Maud Barlow of the Council of Canadians was right. They were harmonizing our social security program with those of the United States. This went on every time they went to Washington. I would be called in and the same story every time. I would be called in for midnight and I would be there till 4 a.m. And each time, the briefing books for the premiers were given to them minutes before the briefing would start. I don't know if that was reported here, but the premiers created a real stink about that. They never had <coughs> the time to look through the briefing books. They were not allowed to copy them. I had been ordered to number each briefing book so that if any book disappeared, I would know what province to track down and get the book back. So in the end, we had a copy. The briefing would be done. The books would be late, would be given to them two minutes before their time. And I would then pick them up. And because there was a document that had been circulated in the free trade office that we were absolutely forbidden to shred any document pertaining to the negotiation, that there would be a severe penalty if anyone was caught shredding. Hence comes the shredding story. We didn't need for Mr. Denis to know each time that he briefed the premier for him to know where he was at on subsidies and on tariffs and on agriculture, he had to keep a very good record. So I was told that in the middle of the night I would have to shred nine briefing books and keep one back. So that the next time he had to, depending on what went on in Washington, the next time he met with them, he would go by that one version that I had kept back. And he said, that one version, I want you to keep it in my vault, and I want, in, at the end of the negotiations, I want the whole set to be there. The story continues that at one point in time, they, the premiers got so upset that they were not 
viewing these books that they started calling the Prime Minister's office. The Prime Minister's office said, well, the Privy Council office is in charge of you people. Contact Harry Twain of the Privy Council office. I suddenly, they were told that I was in charge of these books and I'm the one that Miss Shelley Ann Clark, she's always late with the books. So they called me. And when I reported this, I mean, Harry Twain was the, was the president of the Privy Council at the time. I didn't understand what was said to me because when Harry Swain called me himself and said, Shelly Ann, this has to stop. Is Germain there? Can I speak to him? I said, Harry is not here. He said, well, pass on the message to Germain that we are ordering you in the name of the Prime Minister because Harry Swain was not in on the deal. He was thinking that Mulroney would be angry <laughs> if Germain was making the book late. So what happened? And that I carried the message promptly into Germain Dunis, and I was told, and that was, you know, I couldn't believe it. I said, this guy's going to get fired. He tells me to tell the head of the Privy Council office, tell Harry to go piss up a tree. I couldn't understand why someone of Germain Dunis' level could get away with something like this. I said, the premiers are going to get in touch with, with Brian Mulroney for sure, directly. Because still I didn't know of his, of his involvement. And, you know, this is, this is trouble. Time goes on and the same thing continues. At one point in time, I'm told that I can no longer have lunch breaks. Why can I not have any lunch breaks like everyone else? in case the Prime Minister called, I was told. The Prime Minister of Canada is going to call an Assistant Deputy Minister. Fine, I stayed. And sure enough, there were phone calls seven times a week. And on two occasions, I was fortunate enough that when his Chief of Staff, Bernard Watt, who would be making the call, and I would look up Bernard before the Prime Minister came on the phone. Because that's how it does, and that's how protocol is in government. On two separate occasions, Bernard Bois must have been in a rush because before I could link him up to Germain Denis, the Prime Minister would be on the line himself. So there was direct communication between Brian Mulroney and Germain Denis. And that's when I began to understand that it went beyond the doctrine and that I was in danger because of the position that I was in. I figured at that point in time that there would be myself, Germain Denis, and Brian Mulroney that would definitely know what was going on. And as, as things progressed, and the more and more they gave away, and the more they deceived the premier, I always felt that there was something more that I wasn't being told. I became so frightened that on six separate occasions, which I recorded, I went to my personnel office at Foreign Affairs and demanded to be transferred out of that office immediately, giving every reason but the right one. They refused. In the beginning, they were diplomatic about it. We'll try our best, show them, but there's a big list of people ahead of you. <coughs> In the end, I was told we were given orders by Germain Denis that you were to be removed from him over his dead body. He'll never let you out. When I heard that, fear overcame me again. So I said, then I must go outside foreign affairs to get assistance. The Director General of Operations of the Free Trade Office was from another department. Department of Regional Industrial Expansion. 
I went to Mr. Levy and I said, you've heard about Jeremy doing his reputation. I said, I want to get out, we shout. Can you help me? He said, sure, no problem. As a matter of fact, I have a new position. It won't take you out of the free trade office, but it will take you completely away from Jeremy Denis. I can appoint you as the new head of protocol for the free trade office for our VIP. And I said, that's terrific. So I went away believing that I had this job that was all secure and in place. Within one week, no news. And when do I start the new job? Oh, well, there's still some paperwork to be worked out. And the next thing I knew is that this gentleman was suddenly appointed the head of the Federal Agriculture Organization in Rome and was promptly, within weeks, shipped out of this country. The position was given to someone else. Then I went to Ambassador Gordon Ritchie and demanded to be removed. Gordon Ritchie, funnily enough, never asked me for a reason. Didn't want to know a reason. <coughs> he, he just told me, I understand, and I'll get you out. He contacted Marcel Marseille, the head of the International Monetary Fund in Washington. Marcel Marseille writes back and says, we would love to have Shelly Ann Clark on board. Tell her to contact my personnel people. By the time I contacted their personnel people, I was simply told, and which was not usual, that even though I was an executive assistant and a very senior person in government, that I would have to start over there as a junior secretary. I had two young boys and I was on the verge of the divorce. So I checked around with my friends. I still didn't give up. I felt, well, so what? I'll work my way back up again. I checked with everyone to find out, can a single mother with two boys survive in Washington on twelve, fourteen thousand dollars a year? And I was told by single people that were there that didn't have any children that they were barely making it. So for the sake of my children, I didn't leave. And perhaps that's why I didn't leave. Because obviously it was meant for me to discover what I discovered, the hidden agenda that Mulroney had for this country. And I wouldn't be here tonight to be able to tell you about it. In March of 1988, a mem another memorandum was circulated around the Free Trade Office. This memorandum read, in preparation for the closing of the Free Trade Office, we are requesting that every official that had anything to do with the trade negotiations submit to Miss So-and-so of the archive because she is cataloging all of the negotiating documents for the National Archives of Canada. You have exactly one week to submit all documents used in the free trade negotiations. When I brought this memorandum to Germain Denis, he told me to immediately shut the door to his office that he had to speak to me. We sat down at his round table and he promptly put his hand in his pocket and threw his car keys at me. I didn't understand. He said, you listen to me and listen carefully because if you ever repeat what I tell you here, you will never have a job in this city or in government again. I will personally destroy you. So you had better do exactly as I tell you and pay close attention. I was told that I was going to have to carry out to his car in zero boxes so that no one would know what I was taking out. 
all the documents that he had on the free trade negotiations and that he had used for the provinces and others that were in his vault, in his office, out to the trunk of his car. He said, you're going to have to do this throughout the entire day at two hour intervals. Because of course, remember the memorandum that I told you about earlier. We were forbidden to give or shred any document that had been used in a negotiation. So Germain Denis could not have anyone know that he's stealing these documents because there is no other word to use if you do not have permission and if there's such a memorandum in place that he stole them. He was telling me that no one must know that I was bringing these documents out to his car without telling me where he was taking them. I was told to carefully screen what I was putting in those boxes. I was told exactly what to watch out for. Except, and it's usually the case, he made one main mistake. There was one particular document that I should have never laid my eyes on. And that document, when I saw it, just, I can't tell you how I felt, I can't even describe it. It said, implementation scheme. The first thing I looked at was a chart. This chart looked like a biorhythm chart. If you have seen biorhythm charts, you know how it's at the different levels. But on the left-hand side was the year 1995, 1996, and it went straight up to the year 2005. I flipped to the cover page and it said the implementation scheme in order to put Canada in position for the takeover by the United States of America by the year 2005. By the year 2005, we have to be in place to become the 51st state, it said, of the U.S. With my training and background, I had every opportunity, I must tell you, and the RCMP had been at my home, they searched my home, they interviewed me at length because they sincerely believed that I had stolen those documents. But with my security training at Foreign Affairs, I knew that if I stole any document, that I would immediately be arrested and I certainly wouldn't be able to get the work to come on. So I, even though I was provided with every opportunity, I never even photocopied one of those documents. When I saw the implementation scheme, I promptly tried to remember as much as I could. And the two most important steps that had to be in place, the two things that had to be in place for the United States to want us and for us to be in such a destitute position that whoever would be the Prime Minister of this country at the time would do a press release to Canadians telling you that we were in such bad shape that we had no more minerals, our water was gone, we had no more fresh water, etc., etc., that he would have no choice but to ask assistance from the United States. Then the word would come back to you that assistance was accepted, but on the condition that we join with them. The first thing that has to be in place, according to the document that I saw, is that by the year 1995, Quebec has to separate from the rest of this country. It said on the document, that it would be one Lucien Bouchard that would be funded and put in place by the Prime Minister, then Brian Mulroney. And once Lucien Bouchard was in place, the whole deed would be done by 1995. The second step that had to take place 
in the building of the Grand Canal project. I had never heard of the Grand Canal project. I have to tell you, it was not my area. I said, what's the Grand Canal project? But that's what the document said. By the year 2005, the completion of the Grand Canal project, transporting all of our fresh water to southwestern U.S. I said, my God. So I did a bit of investigative work and found out, of course, that in our, I had been also, I should tell you that when the full text came out and was being given to the lawyers to be put into legal language, I was appointed one of the seven major proofreaders of the free trade agreement. Between that and doctoring the documents for the provincial premier, I knew what was being done with the water. And the key words for you to remember are that in the free trade agreement, it says that free flowing water cannot be sold. But it says that self-contained water can be exported. And of course, the majority of Canadians, when they read, when the official deal came, when the unofficial deal, I should say, not the real free trade deal came out and was given to the public, it said that self-contained water could be transported and exported. Well, most Canadians, I'm sure, believe that that meant bottled water. But the minute you can self-contain snow, you put snow in barrels, you can self-contain snow. If you dam, if you create dams and a canal to reroute that water, the dam itself, the water becomes self-contained. And that's why I have put my entire life aside. I have no idea if I'll still be employed when I return to Ottawa because foreign affairs before I left, I did receive a warning that if I proceeded with this tour, I might or might not have a position. But what I said to them was that I didn't care. If I could not stop, I began my disclosures in the public disclosures in May of 1993, and I'm still at it because of the mainstream refusing to print. I discovered that their reason for refusing to print on my story was, of course, that all the owners are personal friends of Brian Mulvaney. <laughs> when I was first told this, I couldn't believe it. But sure enough, because I had hundreds of journalists from the mainstream media, good people that spent hours interviewing me to establish my credibility over what I was saying, giving them sufficient evidence to proceed. And after all their efforts, when they would reach the editorial board, no, nothing, not a word. I had been carried by my local TV station in Ottawa, CGOH. There's a program called Insider's Report. And that reporter, investigative reporter with years of experience, Charlie Greenwell worked with Mr. Keeley of the Canadian Institute in order to spend weeks of investigation to satisfy the CJOH lawyers in Ottawa that I was credible. What convinced Mr. Keeley and CJOH lawyers that I was indeed credible and there had to be something to what I was saying was because I was able to give them a copy of the report that I had brought to the Public Service Alliance of Canada. Because by July 1988, and discovered this hidden agenda of the implementation scheme, I was horrified beyond words. And I felt that the only way I could deal with this was to disclose but in a safe manner where I would have the support and protection of my union because 
Then I believed that the union had nothing to do with government. I thought they were separate. I therefore prepared <coughs> a full report of my findings. Every incident, including the, the security system in the free trade office, everything. The re and I signed the report and dated it July 22, <coughs> 1988. I called an agent, a service agent. When I told her who the allegations were against, she told me, oh my God, you have to see the number two. Not Daryl B, but his number two, the executive secretary, because when you are carrying allegations about a senior official in government, the agents do not handle such cases. I said, well then, I demand to have an appointment with the Mr. Gentle at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. But I said, this is very urgent. And they did. Two agents appeared alongside Mr. Fusil that morning. And I presented them with my report, <coughs> which they read. I gave them the verbal explanation as I'm giving you this evening. And there was instant panic in that office. It took Mr. Cusel, who has 30 some years in experience in dealing with issues at senior level, a good 20 minutes to calm down and come to a decision. The entire time, they were all screaming and shouting, and this is too explosive, we can't touch it, what do we do, what we must, we must report it to the RCMP. Lord Cusel finally took the decision, well, I have a solution. We don't have to make this decision. This is so serious and so, this is a bombshell. This is a time bomb we're sitting on. Let's bring it to our, the president, Daryl Bean. So I said, fine, bring it to Daryl Bean. And still I believe that Daryl Bean would do the right thing and bring it and demand an investigation. Two days went by, no word. Suddenly, a registered letter arrived at my home with a covering letter from the Public Service Alliance. And the subject that went along with it underlined, Dear Miss Clark, return of the document. And in that letter, I was ordered to immediately destroy it. Because should it fall into the wrong hands, this document could be highly dangerous for you. So the first thing I did was that I got the document and I put it away somewhere safe. So that if anything ever happened, Someone had to know what's going on. And it's that very document that I gave to CJOH and to Mr. Keeley, which showed them that I was not trying to suddenly come out five years later to grandstand it at this last election and fabricating this story. It had been brought to the Public Service Alliance in July 1988. I was shunted, I was then ordered, I was told, to leave the country immediately. The Prime Minister of Canada himself met, met with Mr. Fusil of the Alliance and the agents. And they were told, I want it out of the country and now. The decision was made to send me to a third world country. When this was reported to me, I met with people who had previously been in third world countries. And I was told, you will, you will need a maid over there. And I said, no problem, I'll hire someone from here. And they said, oh no, you won't be allowed to do that. 
you're going to be forced to hire a local person over there. And what is the main job of this local maid and why she has to be local? It's because she's the only one that knows the proper solution and how to clean your vegetables with it so that you don't die of cholera. <laughs> and if you do not supervise this maid very closely, don't forget you're de dealing with uneducated people in a third world country in a different language. So she wouldn't know English. I would have to learn her language and try to teach you English. But before I taught her, how much would she understand? And unlike other foreign service diplomats that I had spoken to that had gone out to these third world countries, they were men and white. The wife stayed at home and the, the foreign service officer would go to work. So there was always someone there to supervise the maid. I wouldn't be there to supervise the person. I would be 10, 12 hours in the embassy because what they offered me to make it extremely attractive, they offered me to be the number two in an embassy, which meant a salary of over $200,000 a year. It meant a chauffeur and a car. Everything paid for that you can possibly dream of. Free trips. Everything. But they had dealt with the wrong person. I was, my life and my children were more important than that. So I went back to the union and demanded. I said, I will not leave. And if he wants me, the prime minister wants me to leave, I demand that it be in a civilized Western world country. It took the Public Service Alliance of Canada one year for my roomie to be convinced that I meant business, that I was not budging and that a civilized country was approved. After the end of one year, they assigned me to one year in Vienna and five years in Geneva for I had I was already under suspicion, obviously, and I didn't realize it because I'm sure this reached this part of the world where Pat Carney announced that she had documents stolen from her office. They thought I had the documents. They thought I had the implementation scheme that I had photocopied it. So I had been barely in Vienna a short while when I came home and my entire apartment was totally ransacked. But when I went over my inventory list, with the insurance agent, nothing had been removed. So already everyone was at work trying to see what I had. I went to Geneva, Switzerland, and I will not bother you with the horrors of what happened there, but I was brought back after 15 months and declared totally incompetent and unstable. You're being brought back, I was told, for operational reasons. You can no longer function. The free trade must have been too much for her, Shelley. Yes. Um, I have a question, Shelley Ann. If we're dealing with a government that is this corrupt, isn't it possible that they could have cooked up a lot of these documents that you were privy to, that you were going to put in the guy's trunk? to get you off on a tangent so they could continue with their real hidden hidden agenda? No, I mean, if we're dealing with this much, much corruption, to the contrary. Much, I'd, I'd ask everybody to retain the question <laughs> till the end so you know the story first and then we'll deal, we'll deal with the question. Yes, yeah, but okay. there, there is more. I will go to that point immediately. When I was brought back in Switzerland, I made a decision to make a disclosure. I disclosed to all the premiers of this country with the assistance of a lawyer, to all the media, to the leader of the opposition, who was Jean Chrétien at the time, and was brought to, the front, to his house. He was given to his maid who assured me that it would be given to Jean Chrétien. Positive that I would hear back, that he would be happy to use this against the progressive conservatives. 
Since then, I have made many disclosures. By September of 1993, with all the disclosures that I had made, Maude Barlow of the Council of Canadians in Ottawa and Tony Clark of Action Canada contacted me and invited me for a breakfast. I spent three hours with the chairperson of the Council of Canadians, and after three hours, she was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was credible. Therefore, when I told her that my plan was to go into the archive because I I had been ordered at home, by the way, by Brown Marine to stay at home and do nothing on full tape. So I had plenty of time on my hands to do research. So when I told Mom Barlow that I was planning to go into the archives with my top secret clearance and to research for what I was talking about, I, Maud immediately offered a senior researcher to come to my assistance and to be a valuable witness, should anything happen. She said, you don't go in there alone, and I said, I agree. So she provided me with Bruce Campbell, who wrote the book with Ma Barlow, Take Back the Nation Two. It's about NAFTA, the other agreement which implements the free trade agreement. Bruce Campbell and I arrived at the National Archives of, of Canada. The strange thing is, is that when I came to fill out a, a piece of paper to obtain the pass, I was told, oh, we've been expecting you, and a pass had already been made up. Bruce Campbell and I asked to see the free trade documents. We were told that's not possible because they're not here. And I said, they're not here? This is five, six years later. Why are they not here? Because the legal paperwork to transfer the documents from foreign affairs to the archives has not yet been completed. The negotiations are still going on. So I took them at their word. I said, okay, where does one find them? I have the right to access to information. So they said, you go and you contact a Mr. Paul Marston. He's the person that's in charge of all the free trade documents, but he's in a building across the street, and that's where they're holding the documents, in a building across the street. So I said to Bruce, even though they said to us to make an appointment, I don't think we'll get in if we make an appointment, so we better just walk straight over there. By the time we came in, same story. Oh, Miss Park, I have been expecting you. We were brought to a table, <coughs> and we were brought an index of the free trade documents that was about this thick. I skimmed through it, then I went through it carefully, and I said to Bruce, nothing here resembles what I'm looking for. But then we will have no choice but to go through the, all of the documents. It might take us months, but that's okay. We'll do it. So we requested to see the documents. We were then told the first shocking news. Paul Martin told us, well, the documents are not here. Well, where are they? They're locked. They are in sealed canisters 16 miles outside Ottawa. And I said, well, 16 miles in what direction? But he would not disclose that. He would not. He said, I don't know the exact location. I just know that the agreement is in steel canisters, 16 miles outside Ottawa. I said, I don't understand. Why would a trade document, what are they doing in steel canisters? I said, what about if I fill out an access to information? Wouldn't you have to go into the canisters? And bring out because I'm ready to, to call them all that. I'll have assistance from the Council of Canadians if they need to take money. But I'm willing to call them all back in. That's when he told me the most shocking news of all. He said that the statute, this is Paul Martin speaking, he said, Miss Clark, I could let you fill out that form, but I won't. Because you'll be 
filling it out in Delhi. There's no point to it because the statute that governs the act to the access to information has declared that the free trade, that approximately 95% of the free trade negotiations documents have been declared a threat to Canada's national security. And I said, they're a threat to Canada's national security? I said, if this is so, when are Canadians going to see these documents? When are they going to be laid out so that Canadians realize that there's something missing here? He said, I've been told, and he says, I saw a document to that effect, that it would be approximately 30 years from now before Canadians would get to view any of these documents. And I put it to you, why are these documents a threat to our national security? And why are you not being allowed to view them till after the year 2005? And that's why I'm crossing this country since the mainstream media refuses to carry me. The only way I have is through public meetings and informing all Canadians and begging you and telling, giving you a solution how we can go about this because I have met with some reform MPs on the Hill they were the ones that contacted me when they heard about me. And one of them is a former investigator with the RCMP that we resigned when he found out the amount of corruption that was going on. And he told me that the best way to approach this would be to call for a public inquiry slash investigation into the theft of the document because you have here someone who stole approximately 500 pages of documents that are not appearing anywhere. So you do not have a complete free trade deal on the table. You are missing approximately 500 pages. And I know where they went because Otter, on my first trip down, stopped me at the other base. Philip is a, is a gentleman, and being a gentleman, when he saw me carry a heavy box, the first thing he did was to offer me to carry that box. I had not taken down the lid, so if the lid had fallen off, he would have seen documents. When I had just finished telling him, when he asked me what was in there, I told him, Phil, as you know, I was one of the seven major proofreaders, and I brought from my own home, some random house dictionaries, and I'm bringing them back. But the one thing with my security uh, training that I've had is that I knew that if anything should go wrong in the future or any leak, that I could not afford to be brought into a courtroom and to have Philip pinpoint the finger at me that he had put those boxes because in total, there were seven Xerox boxes that went out to the official car. I could not afford to have Phil pinpoint the finger and say, oh, yes, I carried one of those boxes and put it in the trunk of her car. So what do I do when you insist to bring the box to my car? When I arrived at my car, I told the absolute truth. I said, Phil. What a dummy I am. I'm so tired I'm not thinking straight. I don't have my car keys. And that was the absolute truth. The only car keys I had on me belonged to Germain Denis. And he said, well, Shelly Ann, no problem. I will stand here with the box and you go get your keys. <laughs> <laughs> That didn't help me one bit because I would have come back with the keys and you would have put the box in my truck. It's at that point that I had to make up a story. He knew that I was the man in liaison person between the Prime Minister's office and ours. Therefore, I told him, I said, have you spoken to Simon in the past 10 minutes? And he said, no, why? I said, because the Prime Minister had called a last minute meeting. 
So it's time they must be looking for you right now. You better get over there or you're in trouble. <laughs> so that way I was able to get rid of them and to proceed with the deed. Because of course he said, I'll report you back to your office because you have to go get your keys. So I told him to put the box under the front of my car. And I said, no one will see it there and I'll take it up places. So I was able to carry it out. But if Bill was brought into a court of law today, he would be able to state that he remembers that I carried out a very heavy box. But he could not say that he saw me put it in the trunk of my car. So Jack Ramsey of the Reform Party said to me, the best way to approach this is that it's like Watergate. You take it one step at a time and then people come forward as witnesses and the whole thing will develop. In order to obtain such a public investigation and inquiry, it will take every single MP in the House of Commons to stand united and together demand that the present government do something. The present government is not going to do anything with three or four or six MPs making the request. They're laughing. Nothing is happening. It will take 100,000 Canadians to put severe pressures on their MPs. Because I can assure you that with their $80,000 salary and their perks, your MP, whether reform or liberal, want to be re-elected at the next election. So you tell me what happens if every constituent in each MP writing writes a letter, faxes, or calls, and demands this public investigation into the theft of the documents. If every one of his constituents demands this, he will have no choice but to proceed. And if the same thing is done with every MP, they will have no choice. They will have what it takes to put the pressure on the present government to have this investigation and inquiry. Because they're human, they like their perks, they like their job, and at the next election, they want you to put them back in. Now, with something as serious as I told you this evening, if you bring that to their attention and they do nothing, do you think they don't realize that at the next election you won't vote for them? They're supposed, they are up there because you elected them up there. The Prime Minister did not appoint them. You chose your MP. You put him and gave him that $80,000 a year job. So he owes it to you and to all Canadians to do something about this situation. Thank you very much. So in, in quick review of what Shelley Ann has stated, the free trade agreement between Canada and the United States was rigged. The premiers needed to be brought on board, and therefore the briefing books that were used to brief the premiers were changed, were doctored, figures <coughs> were changed, decreased in order to make the things we were giving away palpable, and entire paragraphs and chapters on energy and water were deleted. At the end, the documents that proved these books were doctored, were stolen by Germain Denis, put in his car and driven away. There are, in fact, three free trade agreements so that when you are talking to other people, you will have to understand that on October the 4th, 1988, 87, the Prime Minister of Canada presented to the House a 33-page digest of the free trade agreement. A year later, approximately 1,500 pages in a legal document were made public. Missing from that legal document are approximately two to 500 pages. Those two to 500 pages explain to Canadians, would explain to Canadians, the giveaway 
of our country by selling us out. When we spoke with Jack Ramsey, and as Shelley mentioned, Jack Ramsey is a former member of the RCMP. Quit in 1971. There was a major story written in 1972 about the fact that he was abandoning the RCMP because of the corruption within the force. In April this year, there's a new book being published. Paul Palango, the former national editor of the Globe and Mail, has written a book with Rod Stamler, former assistant commissioner of the RCMP, who was responsible for the drug squad in Canada for over 10 years. And at the end of his career, and previously in his career, in charge of the commercial crime section. And specifically, the Special Federal Investigations Unit that dealt with investigating politicians on Parliament Hill. Within that book, Paul Palango tells me that he will state categorically that since 1965, politicians have taken direct control of the senior levels of the RCMP and use it for political purposes. They will state how investigating officers who are investigating senior politicians must prepare two briefing books on their investigation. One copy goes to the uh, commissioner of the RCMP, Norman Inkster, recently, and the second copy goes to the solicitor general. That second copy is made available to the politician under investigation 30 days prior to any questioning of that politician. That gives them plenty of time to destroy any evidence. In the briefing book is listed the questions that will be asked of the politician so that he can prepare for that day. But going beyond that, Commissioner Stamler will state that the RCMP prepared multiple choice answers that would be acceptable to the RCMP whenever they question these senior politicians. So that's the problem that we have when we talk about corruption in Ottawa, we're dealing basically with a situation where Brian Mulroney was an agent of foreign powers and acted for those foreign powers over the period of time he was in Ottawa. You may not remember that I spent three years on Parliament Hill asking Brian Mulroney to stop stealing from 1988 to 1991 because the media reported basically that there was a coup on Parliament Hill. But in 1991, I brought to a court of law in Ottawa an information which was studied over 17 days through hearings by Justice of the Peace Lynn Coulter, the most senior Justice of the Peace in Ontario. Lynn Coulter heard from 13 witnesses, including Deputy Commissioner Stamler, Assistant Deputy Commissioner Stamler of the RCMP, and six other members of the force. Included amongst them was Rick Jordan, who was the officer responsible for the budget leak. And Rick Jordan had refused to lay charges against global reporter, uh, global television reporter Doug Small, because he did not believe there was information, there was evidence that a crime had been committed, as Brian Mulroney had claimed about the theft of the budget leak in 1989. And he stated categorically during the hearings in the pretrial that the charges against Doug Small had been constructed for political purposes by his commissioner. Rick Jordan was the incorporating lawyer for our institute. He's now a lawyer in private practice, having not wanted, wanted to continue uh, work in a back closet at RCMP headquarters, I suppose right in the history of the RCMP in the Yukon. It gets to be lonely back there when you do the right thing. Now, Shelley Ann mentioned Brian Mulroney and Lucien Bouchard. Well, I was a director of the Conservative Party in Hull, Quebec, when I was approached by Rock LaSalle and asked for a 5% kickback on my project. And part of my complaint was that there was a 
an organized scheme working out of the Prime Minister's office collecting 5% kickbacks. <laughs> and when we sat in the court of law, one of the witnesses that I called to testify was the former Minister of the Environment, Suzanne Blegrenier. And Suzanne Blegrenier testified under oath that when she arrived in Ottawa, she was told not to let her position go to her head, that in fact she did not have the authority to sign major contracts. That authority would fall with Frank Moore's, Brian Mulroney's personal lobbyist in Ottawa. He would have to be called within the government department, lead the negotiations toward the conclusion and directing the contract to a pre-assigned contractor. And at the end, she was told she would add an extra 5% to the cost of the contract. And when she asked Bernard Bourgeois, what's the 5% for? He responded, it is a secret PC fund. And she took uh, a second to turn around. She said, more accurately, it was a retirement fund. It was a fund, a secret fund, for after Brian Mulroney's retirement. Now, when you're dealing with 5% off major contracts in Ottawa, you're not dealing with $5,000 under the table. You're dealing with billions of dollars in tax dollars. And government turns around today and tells you that you're responsible for the debt. Well, the evidence that I brought to Lynn Coulter demonstrated that in construction alone, politicians add expenses to the construction of buildings and the leasing of buildings and the servicing of government buildings so that over a period of 30 years, an average building leased to the government in Canada can return $100 million in 30 years. There are a total of 5,000 such buildings in Canada, and that in itself would make $500 billion. The entire national debt we have today can be attributed to one scam alone, let alone all of the other scams that are there. Rod Stamler, the top man in the RCMP's drug squad, testified under oath that the Prime Minister's office was under investigation for drugs, dealing in illicit drugs. And if you don't understand that the RCMP was involved in the 80s in the sale of drugs in Quebec, you should live in Montreal and you can hear the story on a regular basis because there is a, a uh, reporter working for Radio Canada whose name is Normal Lestaire. Normal Lestaire is a separatist. He wants to see Canada divided, attacking the RCMP at every opportunity helps the cause. But he does not attack the RCMP based on things that are invented. He attacks the RCMP because they were, in fact, dealing with Weasel Ross and McAllister, the West End Irish mob in the United States, offering them protection in order for a kickback. The second thing they were doing was buying drugs, getting money from Treasury Board and buying drugs in Paris, and then selling them to the uh, East End French-Canadian drug squad, drug mobs and immediately arresting those people and going on television and saying, look at the fantastic job we're doing catching these drug peddlers. <laughs> but then the money would disappear into the secret fund and the drugs would be sold on the street by the officers. How do we know? One officer was arrested. They brought him to a secret hearing in Montreal. Normal Lestin covered the whole thing in French. And in Montreal, the, the officer was found guilty and sentenced to five years in jail, but walked out of the courtroom. The police said the judge hadn't signed the incarceration papers. The judge said it was up to the police to arrest him. And he walked the streets of Montreal for five years, and the man of would do an update twice a year, saying, how come the RCMP is selling drugs and the officers get off and walk around on the street? Well, his walk on the street ended when his superior officer 
was found dead at RCMP headquarters in Ottawa at Christmas a year and a half ago. They say that he committed suicide. Claude Savoie. Claude Savoie did not commit suicide in my opinion. Claude Savoie was murdered at RCMP headquarters. But who is going to investigate Claude Savoie's death? You see, it said in the paper, suicide at RCMP headquarters, but the facts they printed doesn't justify that conclusion. It says he arrived at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning only to find that two reporters from the Fifth Estate were there waiting to interview him about his connections with Liesl Ross. And there were also two internal investigators from the RCMP to question him about his involvement in the drug peddling. And he went into his office. And in his office he took off his coat, wrapped it around his gun, and shot himself in the head. That's what they say in the papers. And I put it to you that if you were going to commit suicide and you had four people waiting at the door for you to talk to you, would you take the precaution of using a silencer? There's no purpose whether they find you in a minute or in three minutes. You're going to be found The four people are waiting to talk to you at your door. But there is a purpose if the person pulling the trigger needs to get back to his own office through a back hallway. But who's going to investigate that at RCMP headquarters? And don't forget that at the end of the hearing that we had in Ottawa in 1991, where I had brought the information that there was a kickback scheme and that Suzanne Blegren confirmed it and Rod Stamler talked about the drug peddling aspect of it and other officers talked about leasing buildings, buying buildings and leasing it back to themselves. That all of those things led Lynn Coulter, the most senior justice of the peace in eastern Ontario, to lay charges. And who was charged? Commissioner Inkster, the top man in the RCMP was charged. Deputy Commissioner Shoemaker was charged. Deputy Commissioner Jensen was charged. The, the, the President, the Speaker of the Senate, Guy Charbonneau, was charged. Jean Bazin, the former President of the Canadian Bar Association, was charged. Senator Michel Cogger, Brian Mulroney's best man at his wedding, was charged. Frank Moore's former Premier of Newfoundland, was charged and a whole bunch of other stories. And what did Bob Ray's government do? Of course, they're the opposition. They're on another team, we were told every day. These people wouldn't do anything to help the Tories in Ottawa. Well, we know what happened. Bob Ray announced that there had to be a special investigation by the Ontario Provincial Police, that it would last one year. Well, that was in September 1991. And we're now in the spring of 1994, millions of dollars have been spent by policemen investigating. The, the reports are in. They've been in Toronto for over a year now. Nobody wants to move every time somebody goes to speak to the charges that have been asked for by the police, they get appointed judge. <laughs> Brian Mulroney appointed Brian Trayford, the Director of Criminal Prosecutions, judge as his parting gift to Canada on June 24th, last year, in the afternoon on his final day. Early in the beginning, he appointed the Associate Minister of Justice, who had tried to keep me out of court, to the position of judge. Later, Bob Ray's uh, Assistant Solicitor General, working for Howard Hampton, Mary Hogan was appointed judge because she had the information. The guy who wanted to lay charges against Rock LaSalle in Quebec, Van Beaulieu, and who was convinced not to do it, was appointed judge. That's how the system functions in Ottawa. It's as corrupt as you can get. Billions of dollars are stolen. Shelley Ann spoke of the Grand Canal. I don't know if it's fate or what, but I was the president of a high-tech center that I was building in Hull, Quebec, called Minecraft. I had raised $160 million to do the project. And a former deputy minister of supply and services came to me one day and said, you did such a fantastic job, we'd like you to work for us. And I said, for us, who's that? He said, for a project called the Grand Canal. 
And I said, Grand Canal, what's that? And he said, well, I'll tell you what it is. And I don't have to repeat it in the words that I heard it. I'm going to read it to you in the words of Simon Reisman. Simon Reisman, her top box at the Free Trade Office, in 1985, gave a speech. And I read from David Orchard's book, The Fight for Canada. What has become known as the Grand Canal Project would entail the conversion of James Bay from a saltwater body to a freshwater lake by means of a sea level dike at the mouth of the bay. The fresh water pouring into James Bay from some 20 rivers would be fed into the Great Lakes St. Lawrence water basin through the Grand Canal system, which would consist of a series of canals, dams, pumping stations, and underground water tunnels tunnels and make use of, of northern rivers as well as the Ottawa and French River system. Simon Reisman's next words are critical. I am personally associated with the ongoing work of the company. Let me give you some idea of the dimensions of this project. It would move into Lake Huron an amount of fresh water equivalent to twice the present flow of the Great Lakes system. Once in the Great Lakes, it would be available to stabilize water levels in that system. The bulk of the water would be available for transfer through a North American grid to Western Canada and to the Midwestern and other parts of the United States where fresh water is becoming increasingly scarce. The magnitude of the Grand Canal project would be some five times the size of the Apollo moon landing project roughly $100 billion in current dollars. It would take 10 years to construct and finish <coughs> operation. The document I had said $200 billion. And I'll explain shortly why he would say publicly 100 when it was in fact $200 billion. The urgent need for fresh water in the United States would, I believe, make that country a eager and receptive partner. I believe that this project could provide the key to a free trade agreement with the United States containing terms and conditions that would meet many of Canadian concerns about transition and stability. Do we have the flexibility to approach this subject with open minds, Simon Reisman says, <laughs> free of preconceived ideas and prejudices of the past? And I put that to you that that means free of a border between the two places. Do we have the courage and the imagination, yes, the audacity, to take on these two big projects, free trade and freshwater sharing at the same time? I have personally suggested these ideas to the leaders in government and business on both sides of the border, and I have been greatly hardened by the initial response. Americans are fully aware how sensitive both the issue, both issues are in the Canadian scheme of things and would not take the initiative. Any proposal would have to come from Canada. Shortly after making this speech, Reisman was appointed by Mulroney as the chief free trade negotiator for Canada. Now I remember Brian Mulroney in 1983 saying free trade never is not good for Canada. We'll never agree to that kind of thing. And yet, in 1985, he's naming a former Deputy Minister of Finance who's in charge of a project called the Grand Canal as the Chief Free Trade Negotiator. And of course, there are some things that require deniability. You can't be in charge of something and go about doing it and have it on the public record. So they have to bring in a flunky like Germain Denis to do the dastardly deeds so that in the end, Simon Reisman, the representative of the international bankers in Canada, can escape ever having the finger pointed at him. When I started speaking out in 1988, I was told there is a right in this country to free speech. There is, of course, no right to lie. And anyone who lies can be taken to court and tried. 
Well, I invite, publicly invite, anyone whose name we've mentioned here today to take us to court. And let's debate this in public. They own the judges, after all, so they should be able to win the case. <laughs> we, on the other hand, depend that enough information will leak out so Canadians will know the truth. Of course, our government, our media, would never lie to us. The Ottawa citizen, when we started a campaign of asking the Ottawa citizen the basic question, why are you not reporting on Shelley Ann Clark? One month later, printed three quarters of a page on Shelley Ann Clark. Unfortunately, it wasn't her. It was a blind social worker from the Howard, John Howard Society. <laughs> and after that, every phone call to the citizen got the same response. We've already done that story. <laughs> I mean, they took a month to find another lady in town who had a name close enough to print the story. Her name happened to be Shirley Ann Clark, but that didn't really matter. They switched the letters anyways. Of course, newspapers don't lie to us. And of course, during the referendum campaign, it must have been a coincidence that Deborah Coyne, the only person who was for the no, appeared in the Ottawa Citizen directly across from a big sign saying yes. Newspapers wouldn't ever try to mislead us, of course, because they print the truth, like no vote means dismantling Canada. Okay, and the president of the Royal Bank came out and told us, if we don't vote, yes, we're in trouble. And then the next day, yes means jobs, <laughs> is the headline in the paper. This is the national media people who report independently of everything. Well, when I was a kid, I was brought up in a family where the mother was French and the father was Irish. And that meant, because they didn't speak to each other but at each other, that they would have to choose what school I would go to. And the first school I was sent to is always where the boss wins out and that's the mother. So I went to school in French. And I learned the history of Canada for eight years. And then I went to school in English. And guess what? The topic I had the most difficulty with was history. <laughs> it didn't make sense to me. Because what I was learning in English was the opposite to what I had learned in French. The heroes became the zeros and the zeros became the heroes. All of a sudden I had to, I had to accept Wolf as being a great guy. And all the time, it was complaining that I'd won. <laughs> Everything we find out along the life we lead in Ottawa is rigged. Now, I had to walk by a building in Ottawa. And the building is called the Bank of Canada. And I had been told in school that Bank of Canada makes monetary policy for our country. And the two other little companies, Canadian Bank, no British American Bank, no print the money. And I thought, that's the way it works in Canada. But then there are a couple of things that bothered me, you see? At the Bank of Canada, unlike all other government departments or agencies, they don't have the symbol at the door. There's no half flag stripe and a maple leaf like there are on all the other buildings. And that bothered me somewhat. So I got the Ottawa telephone book and I flipped over to the blue pages where it lists all government departments. And I can't find the Bank of Canada in there. Now Bell Canada probably made a mistake because it appears in the white pages with the other private companies but doesn't appear in the blue pages as part of the government of Canada. So I decided I'd research it further. And where else to get information than the Globe and Mail? See, they print the Canadian federal government handbook. They would never lie to us. Globe and Mail, I mean, that's money, that's power. And I looked at the contents, and it said uh, departments and agencies, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, Atomic Energy Control Board, Auditor General of Canada, 
Canada Labor Relations Board, Canadian Advisory Council on the Status of Women. Whoa! Where's the deed? How come we go from Auditor General to Canada Labor Relations Board? Where's the Bank of Canada? It's not there. And when we understand why it's not there, we start to understand what really happens in Ottawa. And in order to explain what happens in Ottawa and before the break, I just want you to remember a little bit of history that you may not have read about. And it begins in southeastern Turkey, where a family called Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, is living. And the Bauer family immigrates from southeastern Turkey to Hamburg, Germany. And they change their name. And their name is Rothschild. And the Rothschild family became a banking family in Germany. And they were involved in pharmaceuticals, among other things. But in those early days, the father came across an idea. He said, Europe has a problem. Businessmen cannot travel across the continent without highway robbers accosting them on the road and stealing their money. So what we're going to do is we're going to send one of our four sons to each corner of Europe. And a son left for Vienna. And another one went to Rome. And one went to Paris. And one went to London. And from these places across Europe, they had agreed to one basic plan. Each son and father would write to the four others every day to tell them what was happening in their own locality, and that would create the first information network across Europe, and each one would accept from businessmen in their locality a deposit of cash in return for a letter of credit which could then be transported across Europe to any of the other centers and cashed in with another one of the brothers. Now the Rothschilds, of course, like all bankers, are in the business of making money, and certainly in those days the money to be made was in empire building. They funded kings and cardinals in empire building missions around the world, and the way they did that is they bought bonds from each one of these people who were in charge of the different countries. Of course, bankers don't like to take a chance on losing real money, so they moved their entire wealth to a hidden valley, defended by mountains and protected against the world by declarations that said they would be neutral in any of the wars that happened around the world, and that country, of course, is called Switzerland. But that didn't mean they kept out of war. It just meant they would never be caught with their pants down. So what happened? Well, across Europe, the same kind of thing happened over and over again. And Waterloo was one example. Napoleon and Wellington were fighting at Waterloo. The Rothschild family reported to each other on a minute-by-minute -minute basis what the result of that war was leaning towards. And they knew that Wellington would win. And they transmitted that information to the brother in London, who stood in the center of the stock exchange and pretended Napoleon was winning and started to unload the bonds of England and caused a panic in the marketplace. And as everybody ran to unload their bonds, the Rothschilds stood back and watched. And at the end, when it hit two pence on the pound, they jumped in and bought the entire lot. And of course, Wellington won the war, and they took over England. And as a result, the Bank of England became the Bank of the Rothschilds. Most people have never heard the story, but they proceeded to repeat the situation in every major city in Europe until they controlled the total economy of Europe.
And in this century, in 1913, knowing that the United States of America would be the empire builder of the century, they moved quickly to bribe and pay off Wilson, the president of the United States, and got him to create the Federal Reserve in the United States. And over a period of some 20 years, increased their influence on the monetary supply. When they got their hands on Roosevelt, FDR, they had a winner there. Because he allowed them to do whatever it is they wanted in return for support. However, the story didn't stop there. It came right here to this country, and it explains why the Bank of Canada is not in here. We had a prime minister in 1935 called William Lyon Mackenzie King. It's really of interest that the two most crooked prime ministers this country has ever had have had Lyon in their name, William Lyon Mackenzie King and Lyon Brian Mulroney. <laughs> in 1935, Mackenzie King had one lost, one lost in four elections in a row, and he wanted to be there for a longer time. And therefore, he made a deal with the bankers. And the deal with the bankers was to allow them to take control of the Bank of Canada and sell us pieces of paper that would be our currency. Prior to that happening, the government of Canada printed money. It would sell the money to the bank, keeping a 2% commission. If they sold 100 bucks, they kept $2. And that 2% on the sale of money to the banks, on all the money that was sold, was sufficient to pay for the infrastructure of government services and operations. We didn't need income taxes. We didn't need GST. We didn't need PSD. We didn't need excise taxes. We didn't need any of that because the 2% off the top of money being created was sufficient to run the country. And of course, the bank lived off the spread. The bank would sell the money and keep $1 off every hundred sold to corporations and a buck and a half on, on dollars sold to individuals. And of course, everything was secure because people brought in pieces of land, farms, houses, buildings, as security, jewelry, gold, whatever. So the government knew every step of the way that they had only printed sufficient money that was guaranteed by real security. But the bankers, once they got a hold of the right to print the money, they changed the system to their benefit. The first thing you have to understand about how bankers work is that they do not print money to cover interest. They only print money to cover capital. If 10 bucks are lent, $1 a piece to 10 different individuals, and each has to pay 10% interest, only $10 is printed. And that means, without any gamble at all, that at the end of the year, somebody can't pay the bills. And that means they go bankrupt. But that bankruptcy has 50, 60, 65, 75% of real wealth in it. And they grab that wealth and they put it to the strongest company. And year by year, decade by decade, those strongest companies grow and grow and grow. And they belong to the bankers because it's their investment they're putting in there. And today we know those companies as what? Transnational corporations. The difference between multinational corporations and transnational corporations is simple. Multinationals are corporations which deal in many countries according to the laws of those countries. Transnational corporations do not believe in countries. They believe in free trade. They believe in moving everything 
around the world, if you put a law in place that says you have to clean up pollution, they'll move the jobs out to a country that doesn't have that law. If you're charging $15 an hour, they'll move the job to a country that charges a dollar an hour. That's what transnational corporations are all about, and they belong to the banks, and I'll explain that a little bit later in more detail. So we have a problem, because these transnational corporations sponsor our political leaders. They buy the leadership of unions. They buy the politicians in charge of political parties. And I will put it to you after the break that the last election was won <coughs> by a certain Martin Brian Mulroney, who used the billions of dollars that he acquired while in office to fund Lucien Bouchard and to win the last election. After the break, we'll continue. While you're having coffee, I would like you to consider, if you can, I know these are tough times, any help that you might be able to provide for the Institute and for the people who are involved in exposing the problem across the country. Bev has a sheet of paper on the table. Those people who would like to work or provide some assistance or become members can put their name on there. There's a bucket on the floor that says impeach Ryan Bryan. And if you have some money that you can spare to help us, the Institute operates on a budget of about $20,000 a year. We're not big time. People had to put up loans to fund our visit to Alberta and D.C. And Shelly Ann herself, who's been shunted across the country for the last five years, is indebted to the tune of about $33,000 in order to try and keep her family intact. So if you have a few dollars that you can part with, there is a bucket on the floor. And we'll explain right after the, the five-minute break exactly how the last election was won and what is the hidden agenda that Brian Mulroney put in place. Thank you very much. <laughs> Explain how the election was bought. The first thing that happened is Brian Mulroney resigned. And with 50 or some other cabinet ministers or senior Tories who did not run in the last election. And I put it to you that that was part of Brian Mulroney's plan. Knowing the Tories couldn't win, they had to put Team B in position. The bankers don't like to lose elections, so they fund the Liberals and the Tories, the Democrats and the Republicans in the U.S. Nothing else explains why you can have George Bush pushing NAFTA and Clinton winning the election and then pushing NAFTA. Have Brian Mulroney push NAFTA and we throw him out in his rear end, and in comes Jean Chrétien, and he pushes NAFTA. It's because they have the same box, you see, and it's the leadership of the party that is purchased, not the membership. Most of the people in the membership have no idea what is going on in their own party. It's the top few people who are in charge. So, what happens if, number one, you do not allow the senior Tories to run in the election. That boosts the chance of many others to win the election across the country. The second is best friend. And Lucien Bouchard now leads the most popular political party in Quebec, who important. It's important because you cannot merge a country called Canada with two official languages into a United States of America, a melting pot that only allows one language. So Quebec <coughs> is to separate first. And then you will have the possibility of merging the rest. But let's deal with political parties first. There's going to be a referendum in Quebec on the separation. 
And who's going to be in charge of pushing Canada? The most hated French-Canadian politician is the leader of the only national political party in Canada, Jean Chrétien. And who is Jean Chrétien? If you believe he's the Prime Minister of Canada, you must believe that Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States. <laughs> because, you see, George Bush was the banker's man. And Mitchell Sharp in Canada is the banker's man, former Minister of Finance, Mitchell Sharp. And in the U.S., George Bush wanted to win four elections in a row, but that was illegal. So they had to find this Charlie McCarthy puppet who would speak as if he was the President of the United States, Mr. Communicator, Ronald Reagan. And guess what? When they got him elected, it went to his head. And Ronald Reagan ran to Reykjavik, Iceland and started making pronouncements that would change history. So they promptly brought him home and shot him. And he learned his lesson. Fortunately for him, the lesson wasn't as cruel as it was for John Kennedy. Because when presidents of the United States don't do what they're told by the bankers, then the bankers staff known as the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the military, take action. And if you've read some of the documentation surrounding the assassination of John Kennedy, some of which I have, legal documents prepared for a criminal trial with all evidence other than what is available or acceptable to a criminal trial deleted. Strictly using the evidence, you will find that no one else but the Joint Chiefs of Staff could have ordered the assassination of John Kennedy. No one else could order that the entire security, 3,000 person security, be withheld on the day he went to Dallas. Not sealing any sewers, not closing any windows, nothing of the kind. No one else could have been responsible when in the airplanes flying over the world in the American airplanes, whenever there's a danger, the officers are told to go to the safe, open, open it up, get out the code books, and then go to the level of security indicated by the codes that are being communicated to them. On that day, not a single airplane had a code book. No one else could withhold code books but the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Who killed John Kennedy? Division 5 of the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover, working with Lyndon Johnson, with Richard Nixon, and the transnational corporations who had megabuck investments for an ongoing war in Vietnam and wanted to remove Castro from Cuba because they had interest in the sugar and gambling. But John Kennedy was no Jesus Christ. He was just Another one of the 2.2% of the people who owned the United States, but he had a different agenda. His family owned property that required interest in Indonesia rather than Indochina. So he was preparing to move away from Vietnam. On the day following the assassination of John Kennedy, Mrs. Judge, who sat at the computer in the Pentagon to feed in the data that would determine the number of people drafted into the military. She had to be accurate within five persons on a monthly basis. She was given a new set of figures the day after the assassination of Kennedy. And when she read the results, she ran to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and said, you made a mistake. We're on our way out of Vietnam and the figures you give me tell me that we will be there for 10 years and 58,000 people will die. The Joint Chiefs of Staff told her to get back to her job and do what she was told. The war in Vietnam lasted 10 more years and 57,500 people died. Jean Chrétien became an important person in Ottawa when Mitchell Sharp invited him to become his parliamentary press secretary 
when Mitchell Sharp was the Minister of Finance. Mitchell Sharp is an admitted member of the uh, Trilateral Commission. Mitchell Sharp is a banker's man in Ottawa. And they both described that very first day Jean Chrétien was brought in in exactly the same words. After the meeting with the bankers, the original meeting with the bankers, Sharp told Chrétien, I hope you realize that what you heard here is secret. You can't go out and repeat what you've heard. And Chrétien's response was, repeat what I've heard? I didn't understand a goddamn thing. <laughs> And that's why they made a Minister of Finance after Mitchell Sharp. Because they don't want people who know or can understand and deal with what's happening in a way different than what they basically want to have happen. So you have Jean Chrétien leading the only national party. And then we move and we understand that in Quebec, in 1980, 81, during the time of the referendum, the people of Quebec were being asked a simple question. Do you want to stay in Canada? Yes or no? And the people of, of Quebec voted to stay in Canada. Why? Because visitors came from across the country, leaders from BC, leaders from Alberta, and they told Quebecers they were loved. So this time around, you can't have that. So you have to have a political force in this country that says, go away or at best do what we do. And who would that force be but the Reform Party? And when we look at the Reform Party and we know the system functions by buying the leader, we have to look at who's the leader of the Reform Party and what's his background. And I'm not inventing anything. I mean, you can go to the bookstore and buy the book, Preston Manning, it's his biography. And it says, in November 1967, just a few months after the publication of Political Realignment, Preston Manning embarked on one of his more mysterious assignments, a five-month contract to be carried out at the high-tech research and production campus of one of the largest military firms in the United States, TRW Systems, Inc. The campus, a sprawling complex of many buildings, housing various laboratories was located in Redondo Beach, California. While Manning spent from October 1967 to March 1968 at the complex, neither Manning's friend nor TRW's company archivist is certain just what he did and whom he did it for. Frank Booth of TRW did find Preston Manning's card, but said it was incomplete. With no copy of Manning's work on file, quote, it seems likely, said Booth, that Mr. Manning worked for one of the government agencies which regularly used the research facilities rather than directly for TRW. TRW ranks 15th in worldwide defense firms and was a major defense contractor in 1967-68 responsible for the basic systems design of the Minuteman missile. Now I put it to you, what Canadian management consultant would be allowed to meet with an agency at TRW, one of the most secure sites in the United States? Certainly not someone who was not an accepted member of one of those agencies. And what agency could meet there. The CIA, National Security Agency, Division 5 of the FBI, these types of agencies could meet there. And Preston Manning had to spend five months there. But did it end with that? No. Okay. The same year that Preston Manning produced his paper at TRW Systems, he and his wife made what Manning has described a fact-finding trip to Southeast Asia to assess the American role in Vietnam. Now what Canadian tourist can visit Vietnam to assess the role of the American military? We're talking 1968 here. The war was 63 to 73. In the middle of the war, a, a, 
and a consultant from Alberta will visit Vietnam and assess the pacification program of the American government, the, the slaughter of village chiefs and the uh, union leaders that the transnational media propaganda called Viet Cong so that we'd all learn to hate them. That's who Preston Manning is. And it would explain why in Ottawa, when we spoke with Jack Ramsey and other members of the Reform Party, we said to Jack Ramsey, you will ask to investigate her case, but Preston Manning won't let you. And unless you have the guts and determination to make a stink and come out on your own, you're not going to be able to look into it. And we're now one month later and we haven't heard a peep out of these people yet. Okay? Now, am I picking on poor old Preston Manning? I got others for you. We've already been through Jean Chrétien and Lucien Bouchard and Preston Manning. Well, you have another problem in Western Canada. The NDP. The NDP might win seats that would deprive the Liberals out of seats that would form a majority government. And to do what they have to do in the next five years, you need a majority government in Ottawa. So what do they do? A gentleman by the name of Bill Lazen sells his company, Comcheck, to the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce for $160 million and proceeds to set up a political party called the National Party of Canada and hires Mal Hurdy to be his leader. Well, Bill Lavin, I would put it to you, and I have personal experiences with Bill Lavin over the last few years, that I could, it could very well be that he received $150 million for his company and $10 million bucks to set up a political party that would mislead caring Canadians away into a party that they would believe was actually against the free trade deal. And that would cause the NDP to lose seats and the Reform Party and the Liberals to win seats. And that's exactly what happened. But of course, unless they did something during the election to prove they were on the other side, these two leaders of the National Party, and again, I'm not speaking of the membership, unfortunately for me, I voted for Shelley Ann. She was a member of the National, Re National Party because she believed Mel Hurdy would help her expose the free trade charade. But what did Mel Herdig and Bill Avin do in her case? They gave her $1,000 to register and refused to have anything to do with her after that. Other candidates across Western Canada <coughs> got four and $5,000 to run their campaigns and had signs and had all kinds of things. When she was, was reported by reporters to uh, Zosky on CBC. Zosky was totally brief before he met Mel Hurdy and could have asked the questions that would have exposed the problem. And he did ask Mel Hurdy a question that led in that direction. And what was Mel Hurdy's response? We are not a single issue party and moved on to discuss anything by free trade. Now who is Mel Hurdy? He was a candidate for the Liberals in 1972. He is linked directly to groups that are known to be part of the New World Order, the Canadian Institute on International Affairs is one of those groups. The Council of Canadians is an offshoot of the groups that were set up following the meeting of the Bilderbergers in the Laurentians and Vermont in 68 and 72. <coughs> totally designed to mislead Canadians into believing 
that they are on our side. And I asked Mel Hurdy or Bill Levin or Preston Manning or Jean Canetien or Lucien Bouchard to answer to these accusations that they are not the people they pretend to be. The money trail. Before you can understand what happens in the world, you have to understand how the money flows. In 1991, transnational corporation, the bankers' companies throughout the world earned profits of $300 billion. That money, that profit becomes available for investment, deposited in the international banks, controlled by Rothschild and Rockefeller. That is a big pile of money, but it has to be put in context still. There's another group of people that make deposits at those banks. The first group is the mob. Gambling and prostitution raised in 1991 $50 billion. So now the kitty has $350 billion. And the generals of the militaries throughout the world buy arms and ammunition with your tax dollars, move them offshore, declare them surplus, and sell them illegally through all the trouble spots in the world. No, what, nothing else explains the arms that are available to Somalians and to Bosnians and Herzegovina and, and you name the trouble spots. Where are they getting their arms? Stolen from the governments of the world by the military general. And how much money in 1991 did they deposit in the international banks. $400 billion. So now we're dealing with $750 billion for investment. And then the security forces, the CIA, the Mossad, the KGB, MI6, and our own CITES, or RCMP, as I stated before, involved in the sale of drugs. And if you don't believe it, ask the state police in Arkansas, Bill Clinton's home state, how they were ordered by Clinton, the governor, to turn a blind eye to the drugs being brought in through the Mena, Arkansas airport for the CIA for sale to raise money for the Iran-Contra affair and all of the other criminal activity that goes on behind the scenes. And how much money did they raise selling drugs around the world? $500 billion. So now we're up to $1 trillion, $250 billion for investment. And then you have the corruption around the world. The Brian Mulroney the Saddam Hussein, the Russians, the Czechs, the Hungarians, the Romanians, the South Africans, the generals in South America, all of them moving the corrupt money they get as kickbacks from running their countries. And you have at least another trillion dollars deposited in the bank. So take my word that when the money goes out for investment, there's a pile of money for investment and very few places to invest it in. Where can they invest that kind of money? Well, the first place is in bonds of the countries they want to manipulate. So they buy on the stock market shares, Canada savings bonds and, and all kinds of paper money so that they can sell it and buy it and sell it and buy it and cause the currencies to fluctuate and interest rates to rise and drop and inflation all over the place 
at will in order to convince you that you have a problem and you have to pay more taxes and get left in services. And then they have their companies to invest in, the transnational corporations, the American Express, the Alcan Aluminum, GE, Westinghouse, and the big companies throughout the world. And they buy shares. And those shares make them the owners. And most of the money is illicit. So it doesn't matter they pay more than they're worth. They have to launder the money anyway. And they end up owning the company. And when it comes time to name new directors, do they name Beth Collins to the board of directors? No way. They name Brian Mulroney to the board of directors and people like Brian Mulroney. And when they've got a whole bunch of directors made out of criminals, they elect the top criminal of the lot to be the president. <laughs> and then that president goes around sponsoring political parties and their leaders. And they get them elected to Ottawa. And they own the Brian Mulroney's and Jean Chrétien. And what do they want from these people? Two things. That they will write the loopholes in the law that allow them to take their money out of the country before it's taxed. And number two, that they make appointments that will follow the direction of the transnational corporations, whether they be the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Norman Inkster in charge of the RCMP, uh, the prosecutors across this country, the chief prosecutors, judges down the line, they are the appointments made on order by the politicians. And even those people who will decide the curriculum of your schools so that the history taught in school will match what they want you to believe, not what actually happened. So what's our country going to do? Where is it going? I put it to you. Quebec will separate. 1995-96. Four new states will be created out of the rest of the provinces of Canada. The Atlantic provinces, Ontario, the Prairies, BC, and the North. Four new states added to Puerto Rico, who by the time will have got rid of their language problem, will make a 55 state, United States of North America. And then the natives of northern Quebec, the Cree, will say to Quebec, we don't want to be part of your independent country. We want to separate from you. And what will happen? Quebec will say, as they have stated, it's okay for us to leave Canada, but nobody can leave Quebec. So the Cree will call for assistance. And who will they call upon for assistance but the bailiff of the world? Who's the bailiff in the world? The United Nations Security Council is the bailiff of the world. And how do we know it's the bailiff? Well, one of the best examples we got recently is the Gulf War. You have to remember that there is another death spot in the world similar to Brian Mulroney, a loony tunes in Iraq by the name of Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein, who may not be as loony as he appears on television, says to the bankers, the hell with you. I'm not going to buy more paper from you. I own all these oil wells. Why should I buy paper from you? I'm going to pay my own way in the world. So what happens then? The American ambassador comes to visit and whispers in his ear, Sadat, you used to own those Gulf ports a hundred years ago. And if you went to Kuwait and repossessed that land, we'd be on your side. And Dummy falls for it and goes over 
and sends his army to take over Kuwait. And immediately, the transnational corporations and their international banker bosses call upon their public relations firm, Hill and Knowlton. And Hill and Knowlton comes up with a plan. How do we convince the world to allow the bailiff to go into Iraq? Well, it began with a nurse in a white dress, tears flowing from her face, looking down at the floor and saying, those dirty Iraqis, they came here and took the babies out of the incubators and put the babies on the floor and left with the incubators. And then they showed you birds full of oil. And they showed you smokestacks coming from what used to be oil wells. And the whole world revolted against Saddam Hussein and authorized the bailiff, the UN Security Council, to go off to the desert and fight a war. But did they fight a war against Saddam Hussein? No way. They need boogeymen. They need people like Saddam Hussein because he encourages us to pay more for arms for our own militaries around the world so they can contain, except of course in Canada today because we can't have a military when all of this is going to start in 1995. We can't be in a position to defend ourselves, and that's the only thing that explains what they're doing today. So what happened when they went to Iraq? They didn't get Saddam Hussein. They drew the line the other side of the oil well. And they said, you thought you were smart. You're going to get away without buying paper from us. Well, now you don't own the oil wells. We own the oil wells. And since then, they've been taking out the oil. And in Canada, what did they want from us? Water. Water. Simon Reisman talked about it. Shelley Ann talked about it. Art Bailey came to see me and asked me to be the marketing <coughs> manager. James Bay, 500 miles north to south, 121 miles across at the mouth. Not a big deal if you know the construction of dams in Holland, as I did before, <laughs> for example. Three dams on James Bay. Rivers flowing in and push water, salt water averaging 35 to 45 feet deep gets pushed beyond the dams. A canal constructed at the southern end moves water uphill to Rouen de Randel for 800 miles. In Cree territory, Quebec being returned to its 1867 boundaries and surrounded by an economic blockade like Cuba and Nicaragua. And they'll be given a chance five years later to choose between eating or not eating. And the condition is drop French as a working language and join the United States of North America as the Louisiana of the North. But meanwhile, we're moving the water down. And the natives say to us, what happens if they dam the entire north? You guys don't understand the weight of water that would be contained in northern Canada. It has the potential for shifting the axis of the earth. What would this earth look like if the North Pole shifted to the equator? A lot of people in England better learn to swim. <laughs> There's a major catastrophe at hand if these people are allowed to proceed. Today, we've discussed the problem. Later on this year, we'll be back with solutions. There are solutions. And it's not tough to understand when you understand that they are 2.2% who rule the world and have another 3% working for them. But that leaves 95% of us on the other side. And 95% are not all thinking people today. And we have to do certain things that will awaken Canadians over the next few months. And one of the things we have to do is take the videotape that comes out of this meeting, because there are a lot of people who refuse to go to a meeting today, 
but who believe what happens on their television set and can watch it in the privacy of their own home. So take videotapes, show it to people, make them aware of what the problem is. I'm not asking everybody to believe what I'm saying. I'm saying use your own brain. Look at the preponderance of the circumstantial evidence and make decisions based on the entire story. And then later on this year, we'll start talking about the plan that will move the 90% of brain dead people who are sitting in front of their TV sets drinking beer into a position where they will start to believe that the game is not lost, but that we, the people of Canada, can make a move to change the things that are happening in this country if we all know what's happening in this country and if we all work together. Thank you very much. Okay.